living this life is having the opportunity to serve. And one of the great, and, um, and when you serve, you make it easier for the person whom you serve. So this morning is a joy for four of us today to serve you on behalf of the pastor in his absence and delivering the message this morning. Go with me to Titus. First of all, should we stand for the reading of the prayer? Amen. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And it reads, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. Old Testament, go to the Song of Solomon. Chapter 8, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, Chapter 8, verses 8 through 14. And it reads We have a little sister and she has no breath. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a law, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with lures of cedar. I was a wall and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who brings peace. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He entrusted the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for his fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, was for myself. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand and the keepers of the fruit. 200. Oh, you who dwell in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of spice. Shall we pray? Lord, as the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it good and flourish, so that it yields for the sower and the bread for the eater. So your word that goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to you empty, but will accomplish what you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our topic for today is stay under authority. And the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Song, is a poem, it's a love song, and it's a book that many blush at because it talks about sex. This song was written by Solomon, a man who had his fair share of wives and women, and of course sex. But also this song is seen as Christ's love for her church or God's love for Israel. And because it's too early in the morning to be talking about sex, we're going to look at the brothers in this song, and we'll talk about sex later on. In studying this particular book, I was really impressed with the brothers. So for a subtopic, we will talk about brothers. Keepers of the garden. Did you know that the word brothers, aldephos, in plural, means a community based in identity of origin? So it just takes two brothers that have Christ in common to make a community. Isn't that awesome? I was just really impressed that two people can make a community. So in the Song of Solomon, these brothers. 
mothers demonstrated the love and responsibility in being a community. So let me start off first by asking, how many of you are big brothers? You got younger siblings under you. Any big brothers? Yeah, we got a few big brothers. I have two big brothers myself, and um, they're alike in some ways and different in, in other ways, but I just remember having my very first car, and it was time for an oil change. And I went to my daddy, I said, I'm gonna change my oil. And he told my older, the older of the two brothers, change your oil. And, and he looked at me, and I just kind of knew, uh oh. <laughs> oh. And when daddy walked off, he said, come on. That's how he talked to me. That's how he talked to me. He said, I'm only going to show you one time. You get you a 16 millimeter wrench. You get you five quarts of Castro 530 oil. You get you a frame oil filter and an oil pan. You take that 16 millimeter wrench and you take out this boat and you let that oil drain in this pan. You put that boat back in that pan. You take your oil pan and take off that oil filter and let that oil drain out of that pan. You put your new frame oil filter back on. Then you take your five quarts of Castrol 530 oil and you pour it in here and this is your dipstick. You take it out, you look, it should say full. And that was my lesson in that super story. Okay. okay. I got it because I couldn't go to nobody else to change my home. And my other brother, not as strong, he kind of quiet. And one day he caught me in the hallway. He said, you want to know how I look people in the eye? And I'm just a kid, and I'm, huh? If you can look yourself in the eye, you can look people in the eye. Huh? <laughs> so he said, come here, let me show you. And we sat on the edge of my bed, and we looked in the mirror for a long time, staring at ourselves, we just looked. <laughs> and then he said, look at me, but don't turn your head. So I turned my eyes, and I looked at him in the mirror. Then he said, turn back and look at yourself. I look, then we looked at each other, and that was my lesson. That's how I learned how to look people in the eye, because of my big brothers. And so, before God formed me in my mother's womb, he had already created for me a community. And he appointed my big brothers, because he knew one day, I don't even know how to change oil and look people in the eye. <laughs> God has appointed you too to be a community of brothers and sisters in somebody's life, either by blood, by occupation, or by church membership that is originated and based on his identity. In our text today, the Shulamite woman, she had two, she had brothers too. It never mentioned a father. So I guess it's possible he could have been deceased. And so these brothers stepped up and became a father for this young Shulamite woman. And the text doesn't say how many brothers she had. They just say we have a little sister, which indicates that they were older than she was. And so in that position, the sister is under the brother's authority. The brothers are responsible and are to show fatherly love to that sister. The role God gave to brothers and sisters is a very important role and no matter what that role is, he has, it's part of your purpose. And life without purpose is meaningless. And you cannot know your meaning apart from him. So even if you are an only child, the Bible tells men to be an example for younger men. Treat older women as your mother and treat younger women as your sister. 
God has given us all a responsibility. Even though the young men and, the, and young women may not realize it, but having brothers or sisters, older or younger, you're in a protective status. And it's also teaching them how to have respect for those in authority over them. So let's look at how this young man felt about her brothers. Let's go to Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5 through 6. And that's just back at the beginning of the book. And it reads, I am black and beautiful, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has gazed on me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I did not keep. So first here, let us understand that the word vineyard has two fold. First of all, it's meaning a place where fruit grows, and also vineyard is the young woman talking about her body. And because she was working in the vineyards, she thought her brothers were angry with her. You see how she, she didn't say my brothers. She said my mother's sons. You know, she, she was, she was kind of ticked off with them. So she had kind of a sense of reproach against her brothers. One reason she was feeling this way towards them is because she was dark and the sun had cooked her skin. Women, had, had, as always, have adorned their skin and took care of it, and she felt like her brothers were depriving her of her self-care. So we see here that she blames them because of her dark skin. She's beautiful, but she's not embracing her dark skin. I wonder how many women don't embrace their dark skin. She wants to print and they won't let her. She uses a little slander here. She said they are angry with her. Now, just because somebody don't let you have your way does not mean that they are angry with you. Remember our scripture to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good to slander no one. And I mean, working in the hot sun will make it feel like you're being punished, but that's not necessarily true. How many y'all work in the field? And I mean, I ain't talking about no garden, but it's, it's normal. I'm talking about as far as the eyes can see is nothing but purple little peas. Where they people at? Oh, Jesus. Absolutely hate it. So I'm feeling the shoe of like when we're working out there in that hot sun. I mean, I did not think that I was unloved, and I did not think that I was being punished because they told us why we were working. Besides food, they say, we showing you how to work. And I'm like, well, can't they be some other kind of way? <laughs> and I just remember one of my many times of pretending to pass out from a huge smoke. <laughs> I got some stories. And it was always me plot to do something. I'm passing out. I'm laying in the dirt, in the hot sun, and my granddaddy was out there with us that time. So I'm passing out, I'm thinking, ooh, he gonna come and, and whip me up and, and, and take me to the house to the cool fan because they weren't turning on no air. Air was for company. And so I'm laying there thinking, okay, is he coming? I'm laying there and I said, let me just raise up a little bit of people. And I looked and he was sitting on the tailgate of his truck, swinging his leg because he was a bit short man, drinking his water. And I'm like, let me just lay here a little bit more in the dirt, in the hot sun. He never did come. I hopped up, Brandy, did you see I passed out? And he just looked at me. And I went right on back to work. I can't stand for a I can't stand reproach. That's how this Shulamite woman thought of herself. Dark skin. 
skin was associated with lower working class women because they had to work out in the field. Upper class women didn't have to work out in the field. So she thought because her skin was dark, people were looking down on her. So she disapproved of how she looked. Reproach. She despised her brothers and she despised her, her skin. A lot of times we think that it is someone else, but it is us looking through faulty perceptions of ourselves. We need to adjust how we see things about ourselves and about others. We think one way about ourselves, but God does not think that way at all about us. That is why he tells us don't be conformed to this, to this world. Don't copy it, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will know his good, pleasing, and perfect will in, you know, for us. Any thoughts about ourselves that do not agree with what God says about us is ungodly beliefs. Don't ever call yourself ugly, dumb, stupid, or any other name because God never calls you that. Now let's look back at chapter 8, verse 89, the brothers. Look what they say. We have a little sister, and she has no breast. What shall we do for her, our sister, on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. But if she's a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Now, this is all the brothers say out of this entire song. The two little verses right here, and that impressed me. Because what they were saying at that particular time, they said, we got a little sister, and she's young, she is not fully developed, but one day, it's coming that a man is going to come by here and ask for her hand in marriage. And they were like, how do we know if she is ready for marriage? They were handling their responsibilities. Normally, brothers don't worry about giving their, uh, their sisters away because that's the father's role. But here, no father was present. Therefore, the brothers are asking questions con uh, concerning their sister's future. Don't you know when you don't know the purpose of someone in your life, you will abuse them? Here she is thinking that they were being mean. They probably say, get up there, like my brother told me, you know. But as a big brother, keepers of the garden, they were handling their responsibility. The brothers knew how they wanted their sister to look at the wife. And they were not with her 24-7, so they don't know if she is a wall or a door. If, they, if she is a wall, they would build towers of silver up on her. Which means that if she kept herself pure, moral, not be like the male woman back in chapter 1, verse 7, who followed after the shepherds to have sex with them, no one has breached her wall, then they were going to give her a great dowry. And a dowry is a monetary gift given to the groom for the bride. The brother's dowry was of silver status. So that means that the man she married must have been above silver status. These were some good brothers. I mean, the next status was gold. She was not dirt down in clay status. So this meant that her future husband cannot come and get her and make her live on the streets. He must match her level of living that she was used to. Or Mr. could just keep on walking because the brothers were not having it. The Bible says, does not say when a woman leaves, but when a man leaves his father and mother, he covers his wife like she was covered under her father's house. He becomes her source as a provider, a protector, and a sustainer. The man she married would have to sit down with these brothers, and they were going to tell how they had been taken care of their sister that he wants to marry. The woman in marriage 
needs to flourish under the husband because she trusts him to take care of her like her father, or in this case, like her brothers. She needs to be able to produce. She produced children, she helped produce wealth, produce stability, so on and so forth. Give a woman a house, she's supposed to produce it into a home. Amen. However, if she is a door swinging back and forth to any and everybody, then her brothers were going to keep her locked up in the closet. They said a house of cedar until she learns how to obey God. Disobedience was not an option. Either she was going to get it or she was going to get it. <laughs> Isn't that something? Her great brothers cared so much about her and here it is, she thought they were angry with her by making her work in the vineyard. They were teaching her how to be a woman that men desire. She submitted to their authority, which made her able to submit to her husband. She was a servant. She was a hard worker, which meant that she is a good character, not selfish, and has standards, and was willing to stay single before she lowered her standards. These male women in chapter 1, verse 7 were hookers. They followed them shepherds out to the field just to have sex with them. And this Shulamite woman, she didn't want no part of that. Her hard work and submission paid off well for her because she married Solomon, the richest man in the world at that time. So brothers, make sure your younger sisters are walls and not doors. Let's look at verse Eight, I mean, verse 10 in chapter 8. I was a wall and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his, I had his eyes as one who brings peace. It's rare to find a virgin in this day and time. The Shulamite woman has matured and has declared that she is a wall. Nobody has reached a fortress. And because of her purity, she has become peace in Solomon's eyes. And that's a play on words here. In Hebrew, peace is shalom. And Solomon's name comes from shalom. And also Shulamite comes from shalom. Because she didn't compromise her standards and was not a door to any and everybody, Solomon found double peace in her. She is just who he desired. This one is the one in whom he loved. Some historians say that she was probably his first love, his first wife, because I can't see these brothers letting her go with any other player player. So these brothers, they had cultivated her to become a queen. All she had to do was stay under their authority. They were caretakers of the vineyards and they were caretakers of her. And by the way, since she married Solomon, the vineyards that they were working in eventually became hers. I mean, that's a divine appointment. She thought they were being mean by not letting her grip and be vain or compromise who she was. This, these brothers taught their sister how to value herself. Her value was not an outward appearance though that is important to women, but her value was in who she was. She was rare, like a precious jewel, which brought about her beauty because she was so different than the rest of the women. She thought they were staring at her because of her dark skin, but her inner beauty radiated from her like the brilliance of a diamond until she didn't even recognize how beautiful she was she didn't have to have sex with those shepherds or, or dress pro provocatively because that works every time. And they usually suffer the consequences of doing so. Her obedience made it easy for the brothers to take care of her. It's hard protecting hard-headed people. Have y'all ever kept a toddler? 
Their ears don't work. And look at how many people were affected by COVID-19 simply because they're hard-headed. It's hard to protect hard-headed people. Obey those in authority. Let's look at verse 11 and 12. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He entrusted the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for his fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is for myself. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand and the keepers of the fruit, two hundred. So the brothers, keepers of the garden, they harvested Solomon's vineyard, like sharecroppers, and they brought him almost $8,500, you know, if it was to compare it to U.S. dollars to now. And their percentage of their harvest was about $1,700. Or so I know to us now they don't sound like a lot, but back then that was, a, it might as well have been a million there. And that was for them, him using their vineyard and tending to it. And so by handling their responsibilities as big brothers, they received a reward. And not only that, their sister in whom they were responsible for married King Solomon. So now, their, their brother-in-law is the king, and that's a recipe for good living. No more share proper for them. You know, Jesus promised us a reward according to what we have done. He tells us in Revelation, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. All right. Let's look at verses 13 through 14. Oh, you who dwell in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountain of spices. Now they are married, and here is the happily ever after. Their rapture of intense sexual bliss. Because you see back then, they didn't have the perfume counters or the bath and body works. So women made their own perfume with a different mixtures of spices. And they would put it in a little pouch and they would place it between their mountains or between their twin peaks. Got the picture? Okay. okay. All right. Let's make sure. Sex is a beautiful thing. Amen. Let's look y'all in church. Are y'all blushing? Are y'all blushing? This is the Bible. Y'all blushing. Sex is a beautiful thing. God has sex to be enjoyed between a man and his wife. King Solomon was for her and she was for him. God does not approve of the misuse of sex. What makes a relationship beautiful is their focus on each other, the desire to satisfy the other. The overall theme in the Song of Solomon is desire. Desire in a healthy situation is enclosed in covenant. A covenant is a sacred bond between kin people. One that we are familiar with is the marriage covenant between a man and a woman. They are choosing to live under the covenant vows of marriage. So when married couples, when they get married, you know, it's time to cut the cake and drink the champagne. And what they do, you know, you, if you marry, you probably, you fed each other the cake. You fed each other, you drunk the champagne locked in. I mean, you're saying that you are to eat and drink of the other person unconditionally, totally, and eternally. The covenant has not changed. That is why what God has joined together, let no one place asunder. In Malachi, God told the Israelites that he wanted nothing to do with their no good religion because he saw how they were treated, mistreated, their wives of their youth, the one that they had made covenant with. And in 1 Peter, he tells husbands to love their wives and honor them so that their prayers won't be hindered. God takes covenant.
covenant relationships seriously. So here, the shoes of white woman went for reproach. She didn't like being under her brother's authority to see it. Uh, her brothers were taking care of their responsibility that she had to submit to them and to everyone being rewarded and she is being taken up in the rapture of sweet love by her husband. And from this, I want you to understand how this passage of scripture fits into the big picture of the gospel message. The young lady and her brothers taught us, gave us an insight into kingdom living. So kingdom living take away one. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. This means that we live in covenant with each other and with every believer. God is our covenant father. He made a covenant with us through his saving plan of Jesus Christ. He made a promise that he will not break. Covenant required an exchange of blood and a celebration with the feast to celebrate the agreement. We all have this one big brother in common, and his name is Jesus Christ, Amen. our Lord and our King, and that's a recipe for eternal living. When Jesus said, this is my blood, drink, this is my body, eat, he made a new covenant with us. Does it sound familiar with the wedding covenant? This is the, a new covenant. His death and his resurrection. When we are not living as brothers and sisters in Christ, then we are not kingdom living. And kingdom living is not the same as religious living. Religious living consists of beliefs and traditions that have nothing to do with God. Religious people cannot handle covenant. That's why they don't live in it. Living under a covenant is permanent because breaking a covenant literally means death. When making a covenant, they will cut animals in half and walk between them, symbolizing that if anyone breaks this covenant, what happened to these animals will gonna happen to them. So once you made a covenant, you were stuck till death do us part. When God walked between the animals during the Abrahamic covenant, he called death upon himself, which happened when when Jesus hung on the cross for our sin, we broke the covenant and he took our place. What was supposed to happen to us happened to him so that we would not have to die. So whenever we see a man, a woman, a child, we need to look through Jesus' eyes and see them as our covenant brother and sisters. Jesus died for them. And remember our responsibility to them, which means that whenever that we, that we never bring any type of physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual harm to our brothers and sisters. And not only that, we also need to see ourselves through the eyes of Jesus, our big brother. We should not try to compare ourselves with other brothers and sisters. We should not despise how we are made because we are made in his image. Enjoy the skin you are in because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is absolutely no mistake in how he made us because he made us for ourselves. Don't try to change your look to be someone you were not designed to be. If you are a woman, you were designed to be a woman and he has a purpose for you as a woman. If you are a man, you were designed to be a man and he has a purpose for you as a man. God makes no mistakes. Kingdom living take away two. Learn how to submit to authority. There is one king and the Bible is his constitution. Mankind lost his authority in the Garden of Eden but Jesus gave it back with his finished work on the cross. We must submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Children must obey your parent, parents as they would Christ. Wives must submit to their husbands as they would to Christ. Husbands in the church must submit to Christ. This is kingdom living. I know some people have a problem with the word submit, but everyone 
someone and everything submits to someone or something, and if it doesn't, it's out of order. Submitting to authority does not demean or degrade you. The word authority means to promote, to release, to give her a person permission to function, creating opportunities for them to be released. Authority brings order, productivity, protection, preservation, validation, safety, promotion, freedom, and reality. The young maiden submitted to her brother's authority and it paid off well for her. She married a king. No more hard work out in that house. son. Because she was obedient, it positioned her for success. There are people that God has placed in this world to be responsible for us if we stay under their authority because they are under his authority. And remember, Kingdom people don't abuse their authority. If your life is out of order, get back under authority. Kingdom living take away three. We are the church, Christ's bride, which means we cannot be adored. We cannot be guilty of spiritual adultery. Even though this song may represent Solomon's first wife, during Solomon's lifetime, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, what a man over the thousand women. <laughs> and they turned his heart away from the one true God. Be careful of anyone or anything that will turn your heart away from God. Kingdom citizens value what Jesus Christ values. Our identity is in Christ. We must know it, adapt it, and teach it to others, not the way the other way around. The world's value should not influence the church. The church should influence the world. Our responsibilities as kingdom citizens is to create heaven here on earth, and we can do it because we authority and he is responsible for us to provide what we need and to make that happen and to protect us from those who oppose it. Throughout the Old Testament, God wiped out all the self a remnant of his people because they committed spiritual adultery, running after other gods that they thought would fulfill them, but there was no fulfillment, just judgment. So stay faithful to God. The young man was under her brother's authority and she adopted their values, remaining a wall, not a door, and because of that, they were able to present her holy and blameless to her womb. Through Jesus, he presents us holy and blameless to the Father. Therefore, the church must not be swinging back and forth like a door with the world in, in, in what they are trying to establish as law. We must be a wall like the Shulamite woman and stand on the word of God and not be shaken because it's popular. God accepts what is pure and faultless and what has not been polluted by the world. Then the Holy Spirit seals us as proof that we belong to the Father. And finally, kingdom living take away for Jesus' first word in ministry was repent. Repentance leads to rewards. In order to be fit for the kingdom, we must repent. We must change the way our minds think. Not one idea of the world can go into the kingdom. We are some trifling people. We should not have to be begged to do right. We have issues abided by authority of those that are over us, pastors, teachers, bosses, husbands, parents, Jesus. A lot of things go wrong in our lives simply because we don't want to be held accountable under the covenant of Jesus Christ. God committed his whole self to us, and it's only right that we should do the same. If you have fallen out of covenant, repent. 
Change your thinking. Turn from sin and get back in line. We have a big brother that has made it easy for us to be restored back to the Father. If we think that our way is right and that we do not have anything to repent of, then we are headed towards destruction. When we repent, it gives God room to pour his thoughts into us. And we will know his teaching and can teach it to others. For the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Spirit. And anyone who serves Christ as brothers and sisters is pleasing to God and receives human approval. As I close, I want to leave you with this question to ponder. Do I embrace or do I rebel against God's kingdom authority? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we praise you for your divine authority and for placing people in our lives to help us live on purpose for you. Thank you for having a covenant relationship with us forever. In Jesus' name.